Hello, Blazer fans, and hello, Conference USA fans. I'm Mitchell Miller with BlazerTV.com, joined by my buddy over here, Tyler Cantrell, and we're here to talk about what else? Conference realignment. Listen here, boy. It's time for the conference realignment. I say, I say, it's time to realign yourself. And everybody is realigning themselves, including, uh, you know, the WAC is having a lot of teams move. I don't think the WAC's realigned. I think it's unaligned. Yeah. I think so, it's falling apart. <laughs> so a lot of teams moving around, and that includes Conference USA. We knew this was going to happen for a while. This has been a storyline for about three years, and it's finally come to pass. Uh, waiting on a couple teams, maybe. We'll discuss that at the end of the show. Uh, but we have some big-time guests from the schools that have confirmed that they're coming uh, just a lot of guests, Tyler. We do, and I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, you know, we really started the news breaking. Uh, Texas State, Georgia State, UT Arlington, schools like that all headed to the Sun Belt. Then you had San Jose State, Utah State headed to the Mountain West. Conference USA also picked up five schools already, and we're going to cover each and every one of the confirmed additions. When you're going to start out, we're going to talk to FIU basketball coach Richard Patino, one of the youngest D1 basketball coaches in the country, uh, down in Miami, going to let us know what's going on at FIU. Also, we're going to shift gears a little bit and head to Louisiana, where uh, Tulane's picking up an in-state rival in Louisiana Tech. Uh, obviously, there's a little bit of Interesting topic between Tulane and Louisiana Tech, and we get into that with uh, Jimmy Watson with the Shreveport Times. He's a Louisiana Tech alum. Nobody better to talk to us about the Bulldogs joining Conference USA. And, you know, that's not all, Tyler. We also are going to be talking uh, 49ers with uh, the Charlotte 49ers with David Scott from the Charlotte Observer. A bit of an interesting situation there, a little awkward. I have to come back to Conference USA. Everybody knows they kind of got kicked out because they didn't have football, and that's where the conference was moving. Uh, Obviously, they have football now. They're looking to come back. We discussed with him uh, that. We also talked. Uh, we also talked to Brett Vito from uh, the, the Denton uh, Record Chronicle, uh, and we talked to him about the Mean Green uh, University of North Texas coming in. So, some interesting conversation there. Obviously, and they've really been looking to get uh, in the conference for a while. Yeah, really and, and, and then that was one Texas. of the number one, uh, I guess, on the list of, of who we thought would probably get in. Brand new stadium they got building up there, so a lot of a lot of cool stuff there. But hey, one of the big splashes of Conference USA right now, UTSA, coming out of nowhere supposedly. I mean, you look at them uh, jumping right into Conference USA. Uh, we talked to the head football coach of U of the UTSA Roadrunners, Larry Coker. He comes to talk about the fan base, things they want to do, and how excited they are to be in Conference USA. Absolutely, and I'll tell you, uh, UTSA. Coming out with Larry Coker, a former national championship coach, to open up their program, lead them into this conference. And if you look around the country, a lot of programs that are starting up are starting with kind of a coach who's been around, who's done that before. Georgia State, Bill Curry, Texas State, uh, Dennis Franchoni. But only UTSA has got a former national championship coach, and we're going to talk to him here today. And that though all those interviews will be coming up right now, as well as some speculation afterwards about what we think the next team in Conference USA, if there is one, uh, we'll we'll be talking about it. So uh, I hope you enjoy and uh, go Conference USA. And we're back. We're talking with uh, the new head basketball coach at FIU, Richard Patino. Uh, Coach, we uh, really appreciate you coming on here today with us to talk to us about uh, this conference news for your school, and uh, congratulations on your first head coaching gig. Uh, no problem. So much for having me. Well, uh, Coach, uh, before we get into the conference news, obviously you you were kind of a late addition at FIU. Maybe the coaching change was a little bit later than, than what usually happens. Uh, how have things gone since you transitioned down at FIU and with recruiting and uh, winning over the old players? How's that process going for you so far? It's been great. I mean, the one thing that I've really been excited about and, and I've had a good feeling that it would be this way is we had to replace a lot of players. We had to bring a lot of recruits on campus. And every guy that's come down here has absolutely loved the place. Uh, we're getting the guys that we want. And, you know, that's the main thing when you take a job is do you believe you can recruit there? And I think it's a very attractive place. It's a great school academically. Certainly it being in Miami uh, can do nothing but help. And guys have loved it so far, so we're excited about it. Coach, when you look at – you know, CS, CUSA has been traditionally known for, for its better basketball programs, but in this new CUSA, with you guys being in it, where do you see is the potential the potential for basketball? I mean, what do you think the quality of the league is? And 
But it, it's, I mean, we're in a very good basketball league now with the Sun Belt, but going to the Conference USA is a step in the right direction for us. I mean, we, we feel now that we can compete with anyone out there when it comes to recruiting. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a top league in the country basketball-wise. Certainly, it allows us to recruit a little more nationally than what we've been able to do and just try to go get the best players in the country. And with, with a name like CUSA and with the tradition that it's had, winning programs, it certainly will help us. Well, Coach, one thing, and I think, uh, you know, your father's kind of spoke about this a little bit at Louisville. Uh, what, what is it like considering, obviously, that this conference realignment issues, all of this has kind of been a football-driven machine, uh, and, and there's been a lot of instability in the entire college athletic world. What's it like for you as a basketball coach? Not, re- I mean, what's it like not being able to, to have control over where you're going and, and not be able you, – you're just kind of living day by day in the basketball world. What, what's it been like with this conference realignment? It's been tough. I mean, you know, we, we dealt with it at Louisville, um, you know, certainly with the whole Big East and all that, those talks. Uh, you, you know, you just got to worry about your job. And you, you don't need to – you got to present to the recruits what you have to offer. Um, and it's always going to change. It, it's a, all, everything's a very fluid situation because of football. Football generates so much money. I understand it. Um, you know, it's not going to be a perfect system, but it is what it is. And you just got to deal with what you have, and you got to live in the present moment and just continue to work and and just you know offer what you can offer. We've got a great situation at FIU. Going into the conference, USA only makes it even more attractive. You know, it doesn't help that you actually, uh, you know, have relationships with some of the coaches. I mean, I know you worked with uh, Coach Harry in it when you were at College of Charleston. How, what's your relationship like with him, and um, and does that help going into a new conference, knowing that you, you, you at least have some kind of connection there? Yeah, it can't hurt. I mean, Coach Harry, and I've got a lot of respect for him. He is a great coach. He taught me a lot. Uh, I worked with him briefly at the College of Charleston, but I did learn a lot with my time working under him. I've got so much respect for what he's accomplished and how hard he works and how detail oriented he is. And they got a great coach at Marshall. Um, and, and I know that, and, uh, you know, it's going to be tough for us to compete with him. We hope to do it. Well, in, in jump into a new league and, and we're going to get you out of here in just one second, but, um, uh, I just want to ask you when you jump to, you know, the conference USA, what do you think the fan base feels about that? I mean, the players and the athletic department is obviously very on board with it, but what do you think the fan base are? Is the excitement level even more so now? Absolutely. I mean, the, the buzz that the Conference USA uh, change has generated has been off the charts. I mean, people are excited about getting you know these schools into our you know basketball arena, into the football stadium, and all the other sports. You know, because that's the most important thing. There's some attractive names that are now going to be coming to South Florida. And that's what it's all about. We're generating fan interest. I mean, they want to see great competition. And we all know that they're going to get that in Conference USA. Well, Coach, we really appreciate your time uh, coming on to talk with us. And uh, good luck with the new conference. And just kind of a last question, you know, uh, uh, at at Louisville, your father sometimes busts out the white suit to coach in. He comes out in the all white. Is there any chance that we're going to see that uh, an all white suit when you come to Conference USA arenas? All I could say is it would look a lot better in Miami than it's in Louisville. <laughs> so you never know. I might fit in a little better around here. I want to see all gold. Thanks, Coach, so much for coming on with us. Thank you, Coach. No problem. Thanks for having me. Well, we're back. We're going through uh, the new CUSA schools. We're going out to Louisiana to talk with uh, Louisiana Tech beat writer. Uh, We've got Jimmy Watson on with us, and he uh, writes for the Shreveport Times and covers Louisiana Tech Bulldog Athletics, uh, among other things. So, Jimmy, thanks for coming on with us today to talk a little bit about this. Oh, uh, thank you, everybody. And Russell is real excited about it. It's something that uh, the Tech folks have wanted for years, almost since uh, they joined the WAC, which was back in 2001. They were just getting ready to start their, or are just getting ready to start their second decade in the WAC, and it's, uh, you know, when, when the WAC lost uh, the regional teams in Rice and SNU and Tulsa, ever since then, Tech has really made every move possible to try to get in Conference USA. Well, looking at that, you know, you guys you guys left the Sun Belt. Uh, New Mexico State was another team that, that did that. Uh, here we are, you know, several years later. One team, the gamble looks like it's going to pay off. You guys are going to get to c- continue advancing and move to Conference USA. The other team, New Mexico State, uh, right now still in limbo. 
Uh, it was kind of known you guys were going to be in the package to come to, con- the, uh, to Conference USA, but has there been a little bit of insert- uncertainty among the fans, just a little bit of worry about potentially getting left out in the cold? Yes, it has been uh, for quite some time, up until probably the last month or so, because uh, it seemed like Conference USA was looking at uh, areas, cities that were had more of an impact as far as numbers. And, of course, Ruston is a, is a fairly small community. It's about uh, 70 miles uh, uh, east of us and uh, has a population of about uh, 20,000 or so. Uh, there's a few more of that in the parish. But, you know, in the past, conferences have wanted to go with the Dallas market, the Houston market, uh, the Atlanta market, or whatever, these, these bigger communities. So the tech people were feeling kind of slighted, even though they felt like their athletic programs uh, were up to par with uh, most of the teams in Conference USA. Well, speaking of other teams in Conference USA, uh, Tulane, obviously very close proximity to you are in the same state. I wanted to ask you about the relationship between Tulane and Louisiana Tech. Now, we know back in Katrina, you guys um, really helped Tulane out, and then it seemed like they didn't really want to have anything to do with you guys afterwards. What what's kind of the is that going to be a rivalry that develops? Is there anything there that that could turn into something more? Uh, that that is kind of a funny relationship because uh, the tech people did feel like they they kind of went over and above what they had to do, and I and I'm talking tech fans. The tech administration felt like that was the right thing to do. Didn't expect anything back from Tulane uh, in doing it because they're. Their area was pretty much devastated by Katrina, and they had to have a place to light. Tech had some empty dormitories that were uh, available because they were going to be destroyed, and so it was it was pretty much a win-win for both of them. You know, try to do the nice thing, try to help out a an in-state school, even though it's a private school. But since then, you're right. There's there's been a little hard feelings there because some tech people have felt like um, Tulane is is wanted to keep them out of conference USA from a recruiting standpoint and nothing else because New Orleans is a hotbed for state recruiting. A lot of the great athletes come out of the New Orleans area, both prior to Katrina and since Katrina. Uh, there's a lot of good people there. And, uh, and and obviously Tulane doesn't want to, didn't want to give anything to help Louisiana Tech in that end. But And then the, a couple of years ago, uh, Tulane scheduled uh, North UL Monroe in a, in a regular season game. I think that's still to be played. But it, it kind of hacked off the tech people because they thought, you know, we ought to be playing Tulane. We want to play Tulane. We feel like we can beat Tulane. So there's been a little hardship. But as, it's funny, I asked that question to Bruce Vandeveld, the uh, Louisiana Tech athletic director, the other day. You know, if who was the uh, was there a particular school that was a leader in getting tech into Conference USA? Was there any uh, no vote? And he said, of course, he was not in the room when the vote was taken, but he understood it was pretty unanimous. And he said they have a good relationship with Tulane now, and it's something that they want to foster and. Uh, he indicated Southern Miss uh, was, was he felt like was a school that's very pro uh, getting tech in Conference USA, but nothing negative at all about Tulane. So I feel like over a period of time, whatever bad feelings there might be uh, have been healed. Well, definitely. I mean, when when it, it becomes something completely different, you know, Tulane, they're they're still in Conference USA. They not that they got left behind, but they didn't get their stadium they wanted to built in the time they want to. Right now, they're having issues with it, so they definitely understand having somebody come into the conference and and the way the conference was looking to spread out, especially with possible Mountain West implications involved, I'm sure they're very uh, happy to at least have somebody else in their state to be in so they can have a travel partner at the very least. Yeah, and I think people have kind of turned over at both schools to some degree. Uh, uh, Derek Dooley was at Tech during uh, part of that uh, era, and uh, of course the Tulane has since changed their football coach too, and you know that's kept kind of smooth things out. The, the biggest problem was some of the players and or coaches at that time from Tulane complained about the accommodations at this dormitory that was going to be thrown down. They said there were big rats in there, whatever, and, and you know, said that publicly, and it was out in the media, and that oh, wow. kind of infuriated the tech people that, you know, hey, we went overboard trying to take care of you guys, use your facilities and everything, and then you go out bad mouthing us, you know, saying that kind of stuff. And it was only one or two people, so yeah. it wasn't, wasn't Plus, I mean, it wasn't fine as a whole. Plus, those buildings were, you said those buildings were set to be destroyed? Yes. Yeah, uh-huh. okay. so they, yeah. they were actually dormitories that I lived in when I was at Tech, and that <laughs> oh, was wow. back in 
seventy five. So well, absolutely, and, and they rolled in. So when when that happens, you know, I mean, I, I go to I went to a small uh, two year college in North Alabama when this was happening, and when, when Katrina hit, and we had people displaced from New Orleans in a dormitory in North Alabama that was set to be destroyed, who were from uh, uh, from New Orleans. So this was not an uncommon practice whatsoever. Uh, but looking at this, you know, not just talking about this rivalry, but looking at, at Louisiana Tech sports in general, uh, there's a lot of thought process they can come in and compete football-wise immediately, maybe even for a conference championship. It seems lately that football, maybe basketball, is trending upward a little bit. What's the overall state of, uh, of the sport um, athletic department at Louisiana Tech as they come into the conference? I think it's been on on the upswing. Last year, Tech was a uh, kind of a surprise uh, finish in the WAC because they weren't expected to do a whole lot. They were picked fifth, picked to finish fourth or fifth in the football race, and of course, ended up winning it uh, with a very strong finish because they lost to Houston, which uh, you know has now moved on to another conference. They lost by, to them. They were ahead thirty-one to seven, I believe, in the second half to Houston, and ended up losing by. Uh, one point, I think it was 35-34 that they ended up losing to Houston. They had several games like they lost to Southern Miss by a point or two, uh, and and all right early in the season, so they started out like one and four, and then they rallied and won like seven games in a row and ended up winning the WAC while it was still a decent team, a uh, different different decent conference because it had Hawaii, uh, Fresno State, and Nevada still in there. Of course, those schools have since moved on. So this year, uh, I'll kind of tell the tape, but. Uh, Sonny Dykes will be his third year as the head coach. Uh, he's got Tony Franklin as offensive coordinator. They've really opened up the offense, and they're a very dangerous team. They're uh, the kind of team that can play with just about anybody because of the type of spread offense that they run. Um, very open uh, atmosphere. They invite any coaches that want to come and watch practice, any fans that want to come and watch practice. There are no closed football practices, at least not during the, the preseason. And so they, they basically say, this is what we're going to do. We don't care if you know what we're going to do because we're still going to be able to do it. So football-wise, I think they'll be able to can compete with uh, most of the schools that they will face in the first year, assuming they stay solid uh, over the next year or two. Men's basketball is on the upswing. It had gotten uh, really down under Kerry Rupp. But last year, uh, a young man named Michael White from uh, uh, Mississippi State, an assistant coach there, came over, and he's really turned the program around. They were – I made it to the finals of the WAC basketball tournament this past year, despite having to play Nevada at Nevada. And um, I think they're going to be really good. Uh, he, he's, it's going to take him another couple of years probably to get a good, another good recruiting class or two under his belt before he'll contend for the uh, Conference USA title. And, of course, that'll be helped by Memphis not being in there, which will probably help everybody in the conference uh, uh, trying to contend for the title. Uh, girls basketball-wise, women's basketball, uh, uh, Teresa Witherspoon, former NBA pro, uh, be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, she runs the women's basketball program. She's got them in a pretty solid state. They're not the lady textures of lore that used to contend with Tennessee and UConn and those, but um, they should be in there in the race and, and all in, uh, from the first year on. Absolutely, and uh, uh, Louisiana Tech's women's basketball program, obviously, like you said, of lore, have been very good over the uh, over the years and, and hopefully that'll help obviously Tulane's got a good program you have a lot of good girls basketball coming out of that state um, but you know I, I like the branding of the Louisiana Tech entrance into the conference and they I think they called it the biggest party in Louisiana Tech history uh, when they had their fans and stuff over uh, did you get a piece of cake out of that or anything when you went to uh, to cover that Sure. Oh, shoot, I got a whole lunch because my parents actually live in Ruston, and, and so I walked right outside the Thomas Assembly Center where the celebration was going on and had a picnic lunch with my mom and dad. So, uh, and, and you know, my parents are almost eighty years old, so it was kind of nice to get to spend the day with them. But it was a huge party, and, uh, and I had the cheerleaders there, flags there, dance line there, the band playing the alma mater, and all. It was, it was and of course, Britain uh, was there too, which uh, I think added a lot to it. The people were excited that. The conference commissioner w- would come over there, and um, I- I'm not sure how many of the sites he made it to. Uh, he indicated that Tech was one of the few he was going to be able to make, obviously, because he couldn't plane hop all morning and try to hit all of the schools. But uh, to have Britain there was was really a big deal for the Tech people. Well, it's good to hear that they're taking care of their fans in the media down there. Glad you got a meal out of that. Know you work hard. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on, Jimmy. Uh, and, and if anybody wants to follow Jimmy's work and, and find more out about Louisiana Tech, you can go to the Shreveport Times.com. 
Uh, Jimmy, I know you also have a Facebook that, that uh, I'm sorry, not Facebook, a Twitter that they can kind of follow you on where you tweet out a little bit of your work. So uh, there's several ways where conference fans that are, are uh, wanting to find out more about La Tech entering can, can keep up with you and what's going on. And we really appreciate your time today. No problem. Glad to do it. Continuing our look around the new uh, Conference USA, uh, we are now going to Charlotte, North Carolina, where we're going to talk to David Scott, who covers the Charlotte 49ers, among other things, for uh, the Charlotte Observer. Uh, you can find his work and his blog there at the charlotteobserver.com. David, thanks for coming on and talking with us today. Glad to be here, guys. Well, obviously, uh, we, we've been talking to a lot of schools uh, representatives about joining Conference USA. Uh, now we're talking to to somebody about rejoining Conference USA. Uh, what's the general feeling up in North Carolina about coming back to see USA? Well, I, I, I think people around the, the Charlotte community are pretty excited about it. it. It's kind of ironic because back in 2005, um, Charlotte was asked to leave Conference USA because it didn't have football at the time. You know, that's when Conference USA wanted to become, a, you know, have all their institutions have football and now they're coming back in 10 years later because they do have it so it's been 10 years but i think uh most people are, are pretty happy with it um that it's um it's a good fit for them um given their starting football in 2013 and and will need a place to play eventually well I, i've seen some uh video links and things to the to the new stadium uh, that, that's that's starting to be built and going up. How ready do you feel that, that the city of Charlotte was for Division One football coming in in 2013? Obviously, probably going to join CUSA uh, maybe a couple of years after that um, as a, a regular playing member. How ready was this city and this university to to take on Division One football? Well, the university is. There's no question about that. Um, and and I think the the sixty four thousand dollar question is going to be the city, you know, at large beyond the campus. Um, there is no Division One football in Charlotte. There's several uh, universities in the in the radius of Charlotte, like South Carolina. A couple of ACC schools, you know, are, are close by. Um, Appalachian State obviously plays um, excellent FBS football just up the up the road, up in the mountains. But there's nothing like that in Charlotte proper. So um, it'll be a first time for the city, and um, after Charlotte plays two years in FCS. Um, we'll see how how well it gets received uh, moving up to the big time, which is going to be a quick move. Um, so it, it's kind of an open question right now. Uh, you recently put out uh, on the on the Goldmine blog, I guess that's your uh, sports blog, uh, Charlotte 49ers blog, um, from the charlotteobserver.com. Uh, you put out an article about how you know they're, the 49ers are leaving a conference that they've pretty much dominated, not necessarily in, but in sports overall. You know, in the overall look of it, uh, had right. a pretty good, pretty good hold on the Atlantic Ten. Um, you know, is there some nerves involved in in making a move like this, going into a conference where there's, ex you know, there's obviously been people in existence here ready to ready and willing to beat you guys down if if so needed be yeah i, I think there everybody has their eyes open about it but again uh the you know the two sports that are uh, the main sports are going to be football and men's basketball football is driving the decision um and everybody seems to be on board throughout the athletic department about that football is driving the decision Men's basketball, Charlotte, um, has not done particularly well in the Atlantic 10 over the last couple of years. Um, they didn't even make the tournament two seasons ago. So it's not like they're leaving, you know, a place where they were, were great in the first place. And, yeah, the other sports um, have all done really well. They've won, I think, like 45 or something conference championships in the 10 years um, since they've been in there in, in, in the quote-unquote Olympic sports. They've been very good in those. But, um Everybody I've talked to, all the other coaches seem to be on board on this and understand why it's happening um, and are up for the challenge. You know, Charlotte has sports like men's soccer. You know, They played in the, in the NCAA championship game last year. Golf has always been excellent. Baseball has always been excellent. Um, and they're going to you know, obviously have to step things up a little bit when they get into Conference USA. But I think that they're well prepared all across the board in other sports to make the move too. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, ECU and, and their proximity to you guys and, and how, how, 
how that fan base may feel about you and how you guys feel about them. From the outside looking in, it looks like a mutually good addition. But if you talk to some ECU fans, you know, they – some of them are saying, um, you know, you could have got somebody else. Why are you getting somebody that's in a similar market to us? I mean, what are the feelings on that? Well, East Carolina, I mean, they're both in the same state. East Carolina doesn't have a natural geographical rival in the conference right now <clears throat> in football or anything else. And this will give them that. I mean, obviously, it'll take Charlotte a little while to become competitive on that level. Um, but uh, I, I think the ECU folks generally are, are happy to have somebody. Um, if not just in football, to have uh, closer to serve the rival in other sports as well. So uh, I think it's. I know the Charlotte people are happy about it, um, and East Carolina people. You know, they're, they've got their reasons. <laughs> you know, they've been good in football <laughs> for a long time, and it's going to take Charlotte a while to to get to that level. But I think eventually it's going to be a really good rivalry, and and then the other sports it's going to be that way too. I think ECU is just a little bit upset that maybe they didn't. They didn't make the move with some of the other schools that left, but at least they do get, you know, they, they, a lot of the things that have been an issue for Conference USA and Marshall and those schools over there is that they didn't really have a travel partner or they didn't have uh, regional rivalries, and now they do have that. Yeah, it balances things out for the conference definitely a lot more on this on this end. You know, it's obviously really heavy in, in uh, the southwest and Texas and and then maybe more in the deep south, but now in the southeast and the eastern seaboard, it's... It, uh, it's a little more balanced. Well, obviously, uh, you know, potentially with ODU coming in as well, that would balance it a little bit as more waiting on that decision. But um, we just want to thank you for coming on and, and talking with us a little bit. And, and you mentioned, you know, I mean, Charlotte, obviously, when they were in Conference USA, had a good basketball program. Obviously, we hope they can get back to that. But even though you mentioned they did struggle in the A-10 this year, is it is it true that they beat the Bobcats in a scrimmage? <laughs> Well, I think you and me and a couple other guys could get out there and beat them on the scrimmage, so that's not <laughs> is it? <laughs> well, we are uh, definitely excited to see Charlotte back in Conference USA. David, thank you for coming on and, and talking with us again. Again, you can find his uh, his uh, material at the charlotteobserver.com. He puts out the, the Goldmine blog, um, and you can follow him on Twitter. He's got that too. So anybody wanting to find out more about the Charlotte 49ers, this is guy to talk to, and uh, he said it himself. He's ready to go out and play against the Bobcats. <laughs> okay guys happy to do it thanks david this is tyler cantrell with blazertv.com and we're back here talking to brett Vito, and he is the uh the author of the mean green blog you can find that at dentonrc.com he covers all things north texas and uh brett we just want to thank you for coming on and, and spend a little time with us this morning oh, yeah, it's a pleasure guys well huh. You know, just kind of opening up, I mean, this has obviously been discussed for a little while that North Texas would, would possibly, possibly be included in this round of realignment for Conference USA. Um, uh, what's the general feeling and perception about going into CUSA for North Texas fans? I don't think Texas fans could be more excited about, um, about the move. Um, I've covered North Texas for the Denton Record Chronicle, uh, in the Dallas Morning News since, you know, about two, since about 2003, uh, back when they were in the middle of their bowl run. And, you know, one of the first uh, things I caught early on in my tenure was the last round of conference expansion when Utah ended up being added to Conference USA and North Texas and Louisiana Tech were the other two candidates. This is a long-term goal that's finally come to fruition for North Texas. Rich Villarreal, the athletic director there, he came in 2001, and he talked about about it when they moved this time around. And when he originally took the job, he took a look around where the North Texas was and the possibilities for the future. And he said that even all the way back then, he said, if we can make it happen, we need to get into Conference USA because of the rivalries, the teams that they would be playing that would uh, you know bolster their – reduce their travel costs. Um, they, he just thought it was really a place they needed to be, and so did everybody else. And finally, after a whole lot of work and a whole lot of money spent on facilities and, and different things like that, they were able to. Right. Uh, cut out a little bit there, but that's okay. Uh I wanted to ask about the other Texas schools. I mean, was there a feeling maybe that that maybe some of the other schools didn't want North Texas in, or or I mean, SMU and Houston are obviously leaving now. 
that leaves open a, a big hole in the Texas market. You guys are coming in, um, UTSA as well. Um, just the feeling of the other Texas schools. You mentioned the rivalries as well. Um, well, the the interesting thing about it is, is the feeling at North Texas. You know, the general feeling, we're not talking about anything that was ever said directly on the record, but right. the feeling was always that SMU did not want to be in a league with North Texas, period. Uh, you know, it's another school in the exact same recruiting region. Um, North Texas had, all, had always been in a, a less, you know, SMU has always been a higher profile league where North Texas is always a step beneath. And the last time around in conference realignment, I think the one quote that everybody really got uh, upset about was there was an SMU official that said that in the last round of realignment, they would support uh, schools in this general direction. That was clearly not the direction <laughs> geographically that North Texas was in. So, I mean, the feeling was always that there was no way that North Texas would ever get into a league that SMU was in. Whether that's true or not, it's up for debate. But once uh, once SMU left and Houston was gone, um, you know, obviously they wanted to stay in the metropolitan area there, in the Dallas area for a, a myriad of reasons, apparently, that seemed to make a lot of sense. And that's where North Texas finally had that opening. They were able to get in, and now they're going to be in a league with a lot of schools that have been traditional rivals, like Tulsa. Uh, like Rice and a lot of different sports and things like that. And, you know, they, they really think it'll bolster their program to be in there. Well, talk a little bit about the sport programs at, at UNT. I mean, obviously you've got basketball program that's that's been uh, – Went in the Sun Belt recent years. Obviously, they're going through a basketball coaching change, but there's some talk about a, potentially a new practice facility and more money put into the basketball program. You've got a new football stadium. Uh, you know, a lot of fans might think, if you just look at recent history, North Texas hadn't uh, been as successful in football, but they've they've kind of forgotten. And, you know, in the early 2000s, you mentioned that bowl run earlier. You guys kind of dominated the Sun Belt. So what is the uh, the general direction you feel of, of North Texas sports right now? You know, I think they're, they're trending upward pretty much across the board. Uh, I, I think really right now, and it's kind of interesting because it wasn't this way before, uh, the Bell Cow program in North Texas is clearly – the men's well as far as major sports go the the revenue sports is men's basketball and it's because of what Johnny Jones did while he was here you know and he just left for LSU I actually talked to him this morning about something else but um you know he came in and North Texas was awful I mean they were arguably this is before I got there one of the worst programs in college basketball which is saying something considering how many teams play college basketball <laughs> yeah. they won 20 games the combined the previous four years before he got there 20 and 20 games in four years is what they had won and then he ended up taking for the program um and turned him around and led him to five straight 20 win seasons uh four conference finals in six years two ncaa tournaments and eventually got snatched away by lsu but he built a tremendous program and he left behind a terrific roster uh you know, they should be uh, – people are talking about them as a fringe top 25 team next year. So that's clearly the program that's – among major sports, that's their best. Uh, football, they did go on that bowl run under Daryl Dickey there for a number of years, and then they really fell on some hard times. They made a horrible ho- coaching hire when they hired Todd Dodge, who was just a complete disaster. And they've kind of rectified that. They hired Dan McCarney, who was a, uh, did a terrific job at Iowa State. And, you know, the first time, first year out of the box, you look them to a, a five and seven finish, which doesn't sound like a lot, but they'd had won more than three games in a season since 2004, and five games equaled their total from the previous two years combined. So they're uh, trending upward there a little bit, and they think the new stadium will really help them improve, and well, and getting into the new conference will help them improve their talent level as they go forward. You know, you mentioned you, you guys got, to replace Jones, you guys got Tony Benford, uh, the former Marquette assistant. Um, how good of a job is North Texas right now? I mean, I know basketball is your big sport. Uh, we just talked about that. How how good of a job is it now to, to come in here? You said I mean, the roster's still there. And then to know that in, in a year you're going to be in Conference USA, which, you know, in basketball has uh, at least had some some success. 
Yeah, I think the North Texas basketball job became, you know, real attractive, um, which I think is reflected in the fact that, you know, they had some pretty high-level people interviewed for the job. You know, Fran Franchilla, the former St. John's coach and the ESPN analyst, he interviewed for it. Um, they ended up being able to snag Tony Benford, who's um, – everybody knew that Tony Benford was going to be a head coach one of these days. Uh, just a terrific assistant coach. Had been a lot of different places. He's the associate head coach at Marquette, known as a great recruiter. He had, uh, and he just seemed like a great fit. He had a background in the state, played at Texas Tech. But, um, you know, I think the reason you, you have a guy like that that's interested is because if you look at it on paper, I mean, you've got Tony Mitchell, who's I've been told by various coaches and scouts and people around college basketball is uh, probably going to be around one more year and it's going to be a lottery pick. You know, and uh, there's other guys on that team. If they all, uh, they had two of two of their best ones were ineligible for the second semester. But um, just that roster is loaded. You know, if if those guys all come back, which uh, indications are that they will, and uh, go into next season, they could be a fringe top 25 team. And you know, you're talking about Tony will probably get go into the draft next year. I think that's kind of a foregone conclusion. All right. A lot of those other guys are 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 young, you know. Their their other leading scorer, Chris Jones, their freshman point guard, who he missed the second semester with uh, eligibility issues, but he averaged 14 points a game. You could make an argument he might have been the best point guard in the Sun Belt last year. So I think there's a a very strong basis for them to build from that. And plus, being the only public school in Dallas, I think that gives them a decided advantage uh, when they you start recruiting uh, kids from the from inner city Dallas, the Dallas Independent School District, and some of the great talent down there. There's kids that want to stick around, and, you know, if you're the only public school in the Dallas Fort Worth area, you know, it gives you a pretty golden opportunity to go in there and pluck some of those kids out of there that to go to the or a TCU. Well, you know, and kind of my last question here, you mentioned stuff earlier about SMU. And and just for conference fans that are that are looking at North Texas coming in, for me, especially if you consider where SMU football was before June Jones got there. Obviously, he's done a good job and and, and uh, turned that program around. But across the board, North Texas athletics uh, is at least on the same level as as SMU, if not above. Don't you think? Yeah, you know that would. Uh... That's a that's a very good uh, debate there, and you know I think you know uh, if you say that there might be some SMU fans that might get a little upset with you, but I, I think <laughs> they're you leaving anyway. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think you can make a pretty good case. I, I think that uh, you know, I think their men's basketball program is clearly. Uh, I mean, if you look at it, it's been the premier program in the Metroplex for the last uh, you know for the last several years. Um, you know, their uh, football's been down a little bit, but, you know, they've got the brand-new stadium to work with, and they've got a, a good new uh, coaching staff in there. Uh, some of their minor sports programs are pretty good. You know, SMU and North Texas, and this is a, we're talking minor sports here, but and women's soccer have, you know, been at each other's throats for years, kind of goes back and forth a little bit. Uh, North Texas did beat them in women's basketball last year. Uh, they since changed coaches, but, uh, you know, they're they are on a fairly comparable comparable level in a, in a lot of ways. Well, uh, that just about wraps it up. We appreciate you coming on with us today, Brett. Again, you can check out his work at uh, DentonRC.com. Um, thanks once again, uh, Brent Vito, for coming on with us today. Well, as we're continuing to move around the conference, we are uh, now talking about the addition of UTSA, uh, the Roadrunners from out in San Antonio, Texas, joining joining us. And uh, who better to talk to than the man that not only is going to lead UTSA onto the field uh, for the first time in a Conference USA uh, football game, but also led them on the field for the first time, period. And that's uh, their head coach, uh, Larry Coker. Uh, coach, how are you doing this morning? Well, I'm doing great, man. It's great to be on with you. And, of course, uh, Great to be on in, in Birmingham. What a great, uh, what a great city. What a great football state. Well, we're just glad that you were able to come and talk to us a little bit today. And uh, you know, I, first thing I wanted to ask you, uh, we're talking about UTSA. Uh, uh, you know, I, when I first heard about you going out there, you, you're a guy you've won a national championship, and and uh, obviously could pick and choose maybe a little bit. You know, where you're going to land. 
what was a what was a selling point about UTSA? But but you know San Antonio is such a great market. They've done a great job supporting the San Antonio Spurs for a really long time. And I wondered why more professional sport teams or things didn't take advantage of that. You guys take the field last year in the Alamo Dome for your first game ever. Over fifty thousand people. How how ready was this city for Division One football? Uh, this city, of course, Texas has great football and. You know, there's a great high school coaching here and some great talent here, and they were so hungry in San Antonio. Really, from from Austin South, there's no there's no there's no uh, there's no Division One football, and uh, we have a great market here. We have the sixth largest city in the country, and and no Division One football, and playing the Alamo Dome with 65,000 seat indoor stadium, we had 30,000 students on campus, and you know, it's just uh, the time was right. The time was right, and, and the following's been super. I didn't know have any idea what we'd had that first game, but we had over 50,000, as you mentioned. At our first game, and somebody asked me how it was. I said it was great. I said the, the big point being we better win. So uh, it's been a great start <laughs> for us. Well, you, you talk about attendance. You talk about the facilities you guys have available to you in that city. But how big of a benefit is it going to be? And, and you mentioned before the interview a little bit talking with us about how difficult a road it might be. But how how beneficial is it to to kind of jump? straight into Conference USA rather than maybe go through a couple of other smaller leagues, but jump right into this this new Conference USA? Well, it's going to be a huge challenge for us. There's no doubt about that. We're a work in progress, but we're, we're going to represent ourselves well, and I believe we're going to represent the conference well. We're going to be competitive, and, and it's going to take some time, but again, I think we'll be a great member of Conference USA, and that's the thing that we want to be and for a lot of ways. And of course, in athletics and academics and a lot of things, we think we can, can be, a, be a good uh, sporting member. We think Obviously, traveling to the cities in, in Conference USA is going to be great to come and, and do these teams to travel and play in the, in the Alamo Dome here and, and to visit San Antonio. We're excited about that. So I think there's a lot of positives that uh, that are going to happen. And again, we've got to we've got to step up, and meet the challenge. Well, Coach, looking looking at you guys a little bit, you you were originally going to go into the WAC, and now because of conference realignment and, and how things have, are going, it looks like that league is at least not going to exist in a Division One football climate. With you guys coming up uh, and the timing that you were coming up, what, what kind of relief was it just to know that you were going to have a conference home to go into? Well, it was a huge thing for us because, again, we're, uh, you know, we've had, uh, when people come here and see us, the commissioners from the, from the Mountain West and, and the WAC and, and certainly uh, Britton Bonowski from Conference USA came to visit us, and they, they really saw what we had and the potential we had here. And the city leaders have really got behind us and, and it was just uh, it was a huge leap for us. But again, I think as people looked at us, they said, you know, uh, this this place is special and it's going to be special. It's it's got a great future, and and uh, they think we'll be a, a great member of, the, of Conference USA. And I believe I believe they're right. I believe we will be, and that's a mission we have from Lynn Hicker, athletic director, our president Ricardo Romo, and and the city. We're going to back this program and back this conference. Now, coach, we we talked to a couple other uh, Texas schools. Um, obviously, we have some new additions in Texas for this. Uh, for this new conference expansion, but also, you know, you have UTEP in there, you got Texas teams leaving. Um, a lot of teams' fan bases are a little bit worried, I think, of the Texas schools, of you guys coming in here, and I, and I think it's because they're, they're a little bit scared when they see how quickly people have caught on to you. You're in such a great market. It's, it's, it's really sort of a recruiting nightmare for the other teams, especially I mean UTEP in particular, to look and see, wow, this team is really, really bringing it in strong right off the bat. Uh, what, is, what is your feelings about the rest of the Texas teams in conference, and how excited are you to be able to develop maybe some rival, rivalries between them? Well, I think it's very exciting because, you know, these kids in Texas, maybe like a lot of the kids in Alabama, these kids in Texas, they want to, they want to stay in Texas and play and give them another market, another opportunity to stay and, and play. And then you look at the rivalries that we have potential to, to develop. And and we have to do that. You look at the Texas teams that are still they're going to be in conference, you say, North Texas and, and UTEP and Rice. And, of course, then you have Tulsa not that far away. Then, of course, you have the Louisiana schools, you know, and I think uh, – uh, we have some great rivalries that we have the potential to develop, so I think that's going to be really huge for us, and I think it's going to really help our recruiting. It already has. You know, we're out now in our spring recruiting, like I'm sure the other schools are, and it's really uh, the response has been great and really kind of allowed us to really talk to a different a different breed of athlete, a better, higher grade of athlete. Are you excited to be able to bring in? 
I mean, the conference is so wide. I mean, part of that's maybe worried about having to travel all the way across the country to say like an ECU or, or, or uh, West Virginia. But are you excited to be able to bring in these other conference teams into your stadium, into your city, and be able to show those potential uh, you know, recruits that may be watching them on TV or whatever new deal might come up and say, "Wow, this <laughs> UTSA! I never, I never thought about them, but man, look at their fans! Look at their." I, I think it's going to really, uh, you know, a lot of things. Our fans, it's going to be special to, to have a chance to see some teams coming here and play that they haven't seen before. Opportunities to go to go to other places and see other other places to, you know, go to New Orleans, go to Dallas, and and go to go to Birmingham, and when when that that that, that time arises to really see those places, those schools, and those stadiums and those type of things. So it's going to be great for for our fans to see that and be involved with that, and, and it's going to be great for our athletes. You know, I think it's it's part of being a being a college athlete. I know I grew up in a small town, Oklahoma, didn't travel a whole lot, but I got a chance to play some college football and places I've coached and get around and see you know, other, other experiences. And I think that's going to be great for, for our fans and for our athletes. Well, Coach, uh, we're really excited about your addition, and we hope to be able to talk to you again in the future. And, and uh, you know, good luck. Obviously, season number two is coming up, and uh, just to, just around the corner, before you know it, before you had a chance to blink, you'll be joining the conference with us, and uh, it's going to be good to see you guys. Well, it's going to be great to be in the league. Again, it's a challenge for us. We've got we've got work to do, but we want we want to represent ourselves well. We really want to represent this conference well too, and we're going to do that. All right, that's head coach uh, Larry Coker from UTSA, the Roadrunners, uh, new new Conference USA opponents coming up for all you guys in Conference USA. So, thank you once again, Coach. I appreciate it, man. Anytime, give me a call. You know, Tyler, those are some fantastic interviews. It's been a busy morning for us, obviously, but we hope you enjoyed those interviews, every one of them. A little bit of nuggets of information in there that you probably couldn't get anywhere else. I think it was a good job of mixing up. I'm glad we talked to a basketball and a football coach. Uh, you know, we mentioned it with Coach Pacino. It, it is a very football-driven um, issue that, that these coaches are having to deal with. But, hey, I mean, basketball sports, Olympic sports, they're having to deal with it too. We tried to cover that too and, and just see what this conference is going to look like in all sports, you know, in 2013. Yeah, and there's a lot of issues involved in that. Travel is one big one. Uh, television, that's a, that's a section we haven't even gotten into yet. We don't even uh, know where to begin because yeah, we're in the second year of a new TV deal now. What happens to it? It's yeah, ripped up. Yeah, you I think the new over. one comes in in 2014 or 2015. We'll have to see how that goes. It's just, it's kind of crazy the people moving and leaving. There's a lot of pieces left in the puzzle. However, uh, there's one piece in particular that hasn't been filled yet, and that is a potential 14th member. Well, it's got to be. You got to have that 14th member to even this out. And and I'm talking about for all sports. Now, it's possible this conference could grow more. It's possible that we maybe at some point add some some schools that don't have football. That maybe what happened to Charlotte earlier uh, in Conference USA's history doesn't happen again. You may just try to strengthen the basketball league. But to have that divisional split, you're going to have to have seven on each side. And we know that ODU has potentially been invited, but they haven't really made that commitment to jump to D1 in football yet and leave the Colonial Athletic Association. Now, I would give another good travel partner for some of the, the schools in the northeast region of the conference. Well, and they got a lot of exit fees involved with leaving. Uh, I, I looked at a couple articles that said they could they could stand to lose a, a million or two dollars over the over the course of, a, of two or three years. That's a lot of money to leave to go. Um Obviously, there's also there's also the potential of the A10 there. Um, Obviously, that, that a, they can deal with A10s. Talk to uh, we know they've talked to George Mason. We know they've talked to VCU, and we believe they've talked to Butler as well. Those schools all could still potentially maybe be in play for basketball only, or, or all other sports other than football in the conference. But you know, you you kind of look at the CAA, and we're like, well, that shouldn't be any big exit fees. There's been some Final Four appearances in there the last few years, and so, there's a so lot there of money some to things lose there. for them. Uh, there's also the other side of it, which is the Big East now. <laughs> Do they split off and have a basketball-only league and then the football goes on to do its own conference? Uh, and then what does that say about the CAA? Um, could could something be done there? Or uh, would the A-10 lose teams to a potential Big East basketball-only? Um, there's a lot of issues there. However, I'll say this. I don't see ODU in the conference. I know that I know that you you see that. I just don't. I, I feel like, and, and, and no offense to any fans that may be in here, before FIU, I, I honestly thought that the direction Conference USA would go was probably a Georgia State, 
to get that state. You don't have anybody uh, in Georgia. And then the Atlanta uh, market's a big market. And then, yeah, I, I, I thought for sure it would be uh, Georgia State and then Arkansas State. I thought that was a natural to try and get Arkansas State in Conference USA. They're, they're, they're competing on a Conference USA level in basketball recruiting now. They're taking recruits from uh, Conference USA schools. The football program could be – this year is speculated to be a 10-win-plus uh, contender. Absolutely. Had, um, had 10-plus wins you know, last They year. got Gus Miles on there now. Uh, I thought for sure um, – excuse me. I thought for sure that uh, the Arkansas State was going to be in there, um, which now, you know – I'm glad FAU's in there, or FIU, sorry. FAU did not get in. A lot of people are speculating that could be the other team. Well, I, I was a little, a lot of people kind of surprised maybe FAU wasn't mentioned. They're not, you know, they're, they're not in the market that FIU is. They do have the new football stadium. It would have made sense to me, maybe for that 14th team to be FAU. If you look at the conference map, they're one of those schools that is kind of out there by themselves now. Uh, yeah, and, and that's a natural rival for them. And FIU has openly stated they hope to continue playing FAU in football. So that's potentially could be a 14th member. You get two teams in the Florida market. Other schools being mentioned, you know, obviously ODU potentially has an invite. That'd be a, a school from Virginia. That'd be a market that uh, Conference USA is not in. But you've got other schools being mentioned as well. Uh, Western Kentucky has been thrown out there. The Hilltoppers, yeah. uh, they're in Division One football now. You're also looking at Middle Tennessee State. Do you want to keep uh, Tennessee in the conference after uh, Memphis has left? Another team, pretty solid football year in and year out. Basketball program looks pretty good. Uh, decent market. What, what, what is Technically the, Nashville market. What, um, what, what's going on there? What, what other schools? I think when you look at it, there's two sides to the market argument. And one side is from Conference USA. They obviously want the best television markets they can get. That's for the television deal. That's what's going to bring in the most revenue for the conference. But I think on a athletic director or a university president uh, idea, they're, they're also thinking of recruiting markets. So it, it kind of corresponds. Usually the bigger television market has a lot more population in it. It has a lot more rec- potential recruits. I think that's where FAU kind of got left out of this situation. There's not a lot of recruits that are going to be – there's not a benefit of going to – one of the major benefits of playing an away game is that you can get your program on display in another city. I don't see the advantage for a lot of teams – uh, to go with FAU. Now, you could also say that same argument for Louisiana Tech. You could also say, well, they let them in, and that's not a huge recru- – I, I, I would argue that Louisiana, Louisiana is a pretty big hotbed. It's, it's, it's a good recruiting area. You already have Tulane, but but there's no – I mean, you can't question right now at this point Louisiana Tech support programs in general, the athletic department as a whole is in better shape than FAU. But I think when you look at it, that's why a team like FAU – or even an Arkansas State wouldn't get in. The market is not there, both for television and I think and I think possibly for players. So um, that's why I think FAU's out. It's it's not it's not a given they're out. It's still possible. I just I just see them going with it. MTSU is a name that has gotten a ton of steam in the last two or three weeks, um, and and it looks like the most natural if ODU does not come. Um, it's just hard to tell. I think I think. Um, I think I think it's very possible that MTSU gets in there, but I, I, like I said, I, well, I would have had a Georgia State and Arkansas I State. Do agree. If you look on the map with the Arkansas State and Georgia State, it just it makes, makes sense, sense it geographically. Makes sense. And and which you know you don't want to lose Tennessee either, but uh, you know, and I mentioned to you earlier, and it doesn't make as much sense geographically looking at the map, except for Marshall. But even a school, the Mac's not been touched through all this. What about Ohio? They've dominated football and basketball. Hadn't heard their name a lot. Could they potentially come out? I don't think they will, but that's a name that you should keep in the back of your mind. I, I'm with you, Mitch, and I, there's not many times that we just agree on something. If the, the 14th member, if it was me, if I was Britton Banowski, I would be pushing for Georgia State. I know they just joined the Sun Belt. Uh, but I think that Atlanta market, you get that. They're a pretty good basketball school. And, and maybe, you know, maybe we do know that the Atlanta market's pretty much dominated by Georgia and Georgia Tech, but you get TV views there. Uh, that is a recruiting uh, area for basketball, for football. Uh, and, and, you know, a t- television deal is going to be only helped by that Atlanta CNN market. CNN is there. I mean, there's I mean you, yeah, you've got a lot of things going on there. I think that is a good market to get in. You know, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I think you try what you can 
uh, to get Georgia State. That would be my favorite, uh, if that's even the right word to say, to be in that that last member. I know a lot of people are vying for it, and that's the best part. Um, it's good to be a part of a league that people want to get into, uh, that they, they actually want to be in. I, I'm, I'm, I know that MTSU feels like they got left out, um, you know, and it feels good to be a part of a league that actually has a demand for it like that, um, rather than have to come out and, 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 and pull in guys people want to be in. You can kind of select your pick. Um, well, but, you know, I think Georgia State, with, with, the, with the market they have, I think you look at a, a team like Georgia State and then you look at a team like UTSA. They're very similar in that they just started up. They just, they're just emerging. I think there could be a ton of fan support in, in involved in the Georgia well, State program. Definitely. UTSA doesn't – I mean, obviously San Antonio, big market. He mentioned, I think Coach Coker said they were the fifth largest market without Division One football earlier. So, And, and another one of those large markets without Division One football, Charlotte. Both of those are adding and, and going to be in the conference – uh, so that is exciting. I don't think I think UTSA. I think the folks in Charlotte are, are, are more likely to go support it than than you consider the Georgia State because they have they already have uh, teams there with Georgia right. Tech right. Uh, and a lot of those people in Atlanta like to make the drive down to Athens and consider this. Even though it's a big market, Atlanta. I went just a couple weeks ago to a Hawks game. There were three thousand Boston Celtics fans at the playoff game. A lot of those people are people who just live in Atlanta. There's a lot of people in Atlanta who are not from there. And they have their ties to their own city or their own uh, college team that they graduated from. So even though the market's large, that doesn't mean it would transcend into support for Georgia State. But definitely makes sense to get into Atlanta. Yeah, and I, I think so. It's a good debate. I mean, there's a lot of teams. Uh, we want to know what you think. If, Absolutely. If, if, if you are, are a member of a team, or, or you're if you're a member of a team, well, if you if you are a football player or a basketball player, we'd love to hear that too. But, Absolutely, uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk. We'll if, talk if, to anybody. If you're a fan of a particular team that that thinks they got left out of the realignment, or or is just excited to be a part of Conference USA or, or doesn't want to be in Conference USA, we definitely want to hear your thoughts. We want to hear your some thoughts. Leave, so leave some comments uh, either either below and, uh, or, or on the one on more the One more section, too, on the debate, just to, to stir up a little bit more, stir the pot, is I know locally here in, in, in Birmingham there's been some talk about what about Troy? What about South Alabama? And, and why were they not got in? In my personal opinion, I just don't think the markets are there. And you already have, you know, Troy has got a good football program. They're building a new basketball arena. But, you know, there's it's just, just no market. It's, it's, it's a tough market to sell. That's uh, an Auburn market. In. And then you look at, uh, at, at South Alabama. That's Southern Miss. Uh, I mean, it, Southern Miss is already in the Mobile market. It is a good market. Mobile's not a bad market to have and, and potentially get a bowl tie in again, you know, with the GMAC bowl where. Conference USA used to have, but uh, I just don't, you know, it, it doesn't make as much sense as some of these others where you have no foot in that market. Yeah, and, and there are teams like that um, all over the place that, that, that may be at the stage where they are ready, but it's just the market's not there. And you don't want to say, we don't want to be like, a an sec and say you know you, you guys don't matter the schools do matter the football does matter it just and, for and conference been, usa it's at the point where in order to bring it to the next level or maintain its current projection there's got to be markets involved and that's just how it's gone so um and you look at the at the football lineup that, that conference usa is going to be able to put across the board if everything goes through and the mountain west goes on and loses boise state and san diego state there is some talk that they could come back Overall, the football is going to be pretty even. The Sun Belt's going to have close to the same level of football as the Mountain West Conference. There was a lot of parity between those three conferences. Yeah, and I mean, like we just said, Arkansas State. Uh, a lot of people are projecting them to have a ten-win season. That's going to be a pretty good bowl game for them. Um, so, I mean, if they can keep bringing in the coaches that they need to, I mean, there's constantly coach turnover of guys that don't want to, be, and it's constantly a rebuilding thing. Um, you know, you never know. And this is not the end of conf conference expansion. It's going to change again. No. So we'll see how it goes. But that's a pretty good argument. That's going to wrap up uh, our show today. I hope you enjoyed the interviews. Hope you enjoyed the speculation. Again, if you have your own comments or thoughts, you can you can comment below or send us an email. Uh, you can give us an email at, um, well, Tyler. Tyler will take your emails at Tyler at BlazerTV.com <laughs> so he can read through the Throw emails. Me out there. Uh, no, he's a football guy. And this is what's really 
football driving, is driving, driving the expansion. Driving this so, concept. Um, you can find us both on Twitter, too. Uh, you can find absolutely. me at, uh, at Tyler underscore Cantrell. And uh, you can find Mitchell at, at Mitchell C. Miller, or you can come to BlazerTV.com, too. We, you spell that out, BlazerTV dot, spell the dot out, come, and you can uh, talk about it on Facebook. Uh, at that for us, you, Twitter, we, we, we want to listen to you any way yeah. possible. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you guys. Um, and definitely, welcome to the conference. We're excited, glad about, to have all we're our excited about the new teams. So. And glad to develop some new relationships. And uh, looking forward to seeing who Team 14 is going to be. Yep.